Hello and welcome to the second of our free podcasts in which aspiring journalist and young Max adult Abby interviews Lord David Blunkett. In this episode, Abby asks Lord Blunkett about his political career, how he got started, what he's most proud of and what advice he'd give to budding politicians. Lord Blunkett also shares what he and Tony Blair talk about over coffee and what he really thinks about Donald Trump. My name's Abby. And I'm going to be interviewing our guest today, who is Lord David Blunkett. Hello, Lord Blunkett. Yes, you can call me David, Abby, if that's OK. <laughs> OK, OK. <laughs> Thank right. you very much indeed for inviting me. Thank you for coming. It's lovely to meet you. Lovely to have you here today. And um, I just want to ask you a number of questions about sort of your career and your life in general, really. Fire away. So the first question that I want to ask you is, what made you want to become a politician? I think two, two main things. One, my upbringing, where I was brought up in the north of Sheffield, people working extremely hard for very little. My dad was killed in a works accident when I was 12, which obviously has a major impact on you. Uh, my grandfather, who'd lived with us, couldn't stay because my mum had breast cancer back in the 1950s. Very few people survived. She did, but it was quite horrendous. And my dad, my granddad went into what was more than a geriatric ward, it was something from the 19th century. And I swore then as a teenager that I would do something to make the world a better place. And the second bit along with that was reading history. I loved history and history taught me, firstly, you shouldn't live in it, but you should learn from it. And with learning from it, I knew that we had to get stuck in if we were gonna change the world, if we were gonna do something about it, I needed to get involved and people do that in all sorts of ways, including with Max, of course, being part of a, a, a charity, being part of a, a way of changing things is, is a good thing in itself. My route was politics and I had to decide which party I would join when I was 16. And I, I joined the party that was nearest to the things that were right for me, that drove me, which was equality and justice and making the world a fairer place, so I joined the Labour Party. Wow, that's really, really interesting. What would you say was the highlight of your career? Oh, goodness me. Uh, quite a number of things. Sometimes things that people wouldn't necessarily know about. When I was the leader of Sheffield City Council way back in the 1980s when Margaret Thatcher was Prime Minister, we set up a, a system, we set it up in the 1970s, for uh, free and cheap bus travel in the whole of Sheffield and South Yorkshire. Uh, buses in the city centre, around the, the shopping and leisure areas were free. You could travel anywhere for 10p uh, in South Yorkshire. And that was something I was really proud of and I played a, a part in uh, putting together. Nationally, what I was able to do as Education and Employment Secretary is the thing I, I loved the most because we were transforming people's lives. We were completely rebuilding schools. We were introducing uh, Sure Start and nursery education programs for the first time. Uh, we introduced literacy and numeracy programs in primary school. We reopened access to higher education that had been frozen for eight years. Uh, there were all sorts of things happening that was both the kind of things that I'd come into politics to do but also I could see was making a difference to people's lives. It was a bit different at the Home Office. The Home Office uh, had all the most horrendous things you could think of. It wasn't exactly a bundle of fun. We were dealing with counter-terrorism on the back of the 11th of September attack on the World Trade Center in New York in 2001. I'd only been Home Secretary three months uh, when that took place. Uh, I had policing, I had prisons and probation. Uh, and the justice system at that time, before it was split uh, in England, it's different in Scotland, but it was split between the Home Office and the Department of Justice, uh, which was created. I had a lot of that, including drugs and uh, uh, immigration and all the things that make a politician's life really miserable. But it was still worth being there and doing it because it was so critically important to the well-being of Britain. 
Well, I actually think you're a very inspirational person, to be honest. Um, well, I, I, I hope I can continue just being there and saying to parents and to youngsters and to employers and to public authorities, pull your finger out. We've still an enormous long way to go in terms of facilities and equal opportunity and access to leisure and to work, haven't we? You must be finding that happy as well. I'm yes. in danger of interviewing you if I'm not here. <laughs> but but you, you must find that, mustn't you? It's, it's still a big challenge, isn't it? Yes, it's definitely a challenge for all of us. Mm. And, and, you know, the challenge doesn't disappear if people are positive and helpful, but it makes it a lot easier. It does make it a lot easier for all of us, I think. Mm. So um, I think that's one of the messages that we collectively, all of us, have got to get out. And I still try and do that, including from the House of Lords, because it gives me a chance to speak, to ask questions, uh, to raise the profile of issues. We were debating yesterday what we were going to do about the remaining hereditary peers. And we were trying to sort that out. And in the middle of the debate, we were talking about the, the diversity in the House of Lords. And actually, there are more people with disabilities, not just because there's a lot of old codgers. Uh, <laughs> there are more people with disabilities. There are three of us who are blind, totally blind. Two of us have got guide dogs. Uh, and two of us, one of whom is a conservative peer, Chris Holmes, was in a Paralympian. He was a swimmer. Uh, and uh, the former chair of the Royal National Institute for the Blind, Colin Lowe, uh, who is a crossbench peer and he doesn't have a guide dog. Uh, he uses a cane and I've been using a long cane. Do, uh, do, do, you, have, do you have a cane, uh, Abby? Yes, yeah. I do. Well, I call my cane Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> because, because it's wide, it's thick, it's rigid. <laughs> And it's been pretty useless, actually. <laughs> so that's, that's what I described it as. What was difficult about being a politician? Well, you're not very popular. It doesn't matter what you do and how well you do it. Um, people, you know, have someone to blame, and it's going to be politicians. So, not on a personal level. It, it wasn't the in interaction, meeting people, which I loved and. Uh, going to community groups, it's just the, the you know what you get on. Well, it used to be radio, television, and the print media. Now, of course, for all of you, you, you of your age, Abby, I think you're twenty. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, it's social media now, and I think it's worse for people now because people think they can put things on Facebook or YouTube or Twit or Twitter. Um, and text what they'd never say to you in person. And that's made it much more difficult, I think, just because you can take brickbats, but after a bit, it starts to wear down. And the, the, you know it, you expect to be criticized because you're on the public platform and you've asked for it and nobody's gonna be sympathetic. But when it gets to real nasty abuse, and there's a lot of that about now, then I think that erodes our democracy. Because, you know, you, if young people like yourself said, you know, w would you recommend you came into politics? I'd have to think three times before saying yes. I would say yes. I'd say get a life, have a bit of fun, um, you know, make your way and then come in. But I'd say you need a thick skin. OK, if you can be a journalist, you need a thick skin as well, by the way, because people will blame you. Mm -hmm. If they're not blaming me, they'll blame you, Abby, OK? <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I, I do agree when you say about social media. Yeah, in the past, I would have received a letter, and if it was abusive, then it was between me and them. But now, the, it would all be spread round. There's some lovely stories. One of the Conservatives who I get on with very well, George Young, who's now in the Lords, when he was in the Commons and I was serving on a committee with him, uh, we were up at, uh, in, in the committee at 3 a.m. in the morning and he told a wonderful story of how a man wrote to him saying, I don't expect you'll ever reply, but if you do, um, you know, ring me at whatever time you're reading this letter. And it was 3.30 in the morning, <laughs> so he rang him and he said, why are you waking me up? He said, well, you, you were abusive in your letter. You said you didn't believe for a minute 
that you'd actually read it and you told me to ring you when you were reading it. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Don't ask someone to do something and then moan at them for doing Absolutely it. That's what I right. say. There's nothing new there, Abby. <laughs> I'm sorry if I sound too honest, but it's, it's true. Yeah. Do you still stay in touch with Tony Blair or any other cabinet ministers? Yes, at the time we're recording this interview, I have arranged to see Tony Blair for a coffee on the coming Tuesday morning. So it's interesting. About once every six months we get together um, and we grumble about how the world's going and what's happening to it. And social democracy is having a really hard time right across Western Europe and North America. So I'd, I'd like to discuss with him what we're going to do about that. You sound a bit like me when you say about meeting up and having a grumble about the way the world's going. Yeah, but, but I've got an excuse. I'm older. <laughs> You'll have to be much more positive, won't you? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So thank you very much, Abby, for a tremendous interview. And I think we're now over to the audience. Hello, uh, David. Uh, my name's Kevin. I work for Look UK as well. Um, so you were talking earlier about, you know, young people getting into politics. What would you say are the best ways for young people looking into get in, getting into politics to do that? How can they engage in politics? How can they begin to get a career in it? I think if... Um, if I, I have to say this because I think it's just practically true. You do need to come to a political party. That There are people standing as independents for local government. There have been MPs over the last 20 years elected. Uh, a couple of them on the back of uh, local campaigns, one elected uh, back in 2001 in, in relation to the health service and closure of a local hospital, that you do get that. But on the whole, the route is through a political party, the party that's nearest to you, the one that you feel is, is a vehicle that you can engage with. Because no political party reflects everything we feel and think. Uh, we're not automatons, which is why I'm really worried about parties where the message comes down from the top and you've got to do what you're told because uh, that's not how it should work. Uh, getting involved with the local branch, whichever the party is, uh, showing that you can do it, the hard bits of the grind of campaigning, um, maybe standing for local election, parish, district, county, whatever it might be, city, um, and demonstrating that you've got a wider interest because it's not the, the route to political action isn't just getting into parliament whether it's the devolved assemblies or regional uh, authorities of developing england or, or or the westminster parliament that isn't what politics is solely about it's about changing the world in other ways so campaigns at local or national level uh, which change people's minds bring pressure to bear are just as important as part of our democracy. And that, I think that's the way to do it. Then make a choice at what level and how intensely do you want to be involved? Some people would just like to do a little and come in from time to time and campaign on a specific issue that's closest to their heart. Other people want to get really stuck in. I think the, the last piece of advice is always keep a life though, because if you overdo it, you begin to lose that humanity, that connection when you first came in and that's what I was talking about in government I was in real danger of losing myself and when I stepped down from the cabinet <coughs> members of my family said welcome back which is a pretty clear message that I'd gone <laughs> thank you what would be your three um, points um, of getting into politics okay the, the three things to get in um, know what, what values you want to espouse. In other words, what is it you want to do? What is driving you? What are, what are the, um, the reasons behind wanting to be in politics? Secondly, understand that you will have to put in the most enormous time and effort. It's not going to happen unless you do. And thirdly, be incredibly patient, because sometimes it takes a, an enormous amount of time to make progress. I think he's a really down-to-earth person and 
Um, to my family, he's a massive inspiration to us all. Um, because after I got diagnosed, my mum was doing a lot of research into his life and how he coped with growing up without any vision. And I think that has grown on me, if you know what I mean. There's that person out there with that inspiration to give out to the world and then is obviously his involvement with politics. So what's the key thing you'll remember from the interview that you just saw? Um... Probably the thing about he said about his white cane. <laughs> about Donald Trump. His cane's called Donald Trump. That just literally... That, that, that made the day, to be honest. This special podcast was made possible by the Mycrop Falmia, Anop Falmia and Collar Bonus Support Charity. The episode was written by Helen O'Brien and produced by Audio Ollie, Ollie Harrison.